During World War II, 28,000 enemy troops combed an island for two and a half years searching for one of these three men. What is your name, please? My name is George Tweed. My name is George Tweed. My name is George Tweed. Only one of these men is the real George Tweed. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Tom Poston, Peggy Cass, Gene Rayburn, and Kitty Carlisle. On to Tell the Truth with your host, Bud Cox. Thank you very much and welcome once again to To Tell the Truth. Brought to you this week by Anison, the headache remedy with a special combination of ingredients to relieve pain, fight depression, calm jittery nerves. Anison. Good evening, panel. Good evening. Hi, Bud. Hi, Bud. Hi, Bud. All set with your affidavits there? Will oh, you kindly yeah. open up the envelope, which you've never seen before, and uh, follow along as I read with the one mark number one. I, George Tweed, was one of six Americans who decided to hide in the jungle rather than surrender when the Japanese took the island of Guam in December of 1941. The other five were all tracked down and killed. The enemy knew I was at large, and for more than two and a half years, I lived like a hunted animal, finding shelter where I could in caves and under boulders. I had to avoid not only the 28,000 Japanese, but also most of the island natives who were friendly but talkative. In June of 1944, an American fleet appeared off Guam. I swam out to the ships and gave them information on the enemy defenses which saved many American lives in the subsequent invasion. For this action, I was awarded the Legion of Merit by the United States Navy, signed George Tweed. <laughs> panel, these three stalwart gentlemen all claim to be George Tweed, World War II hero, and we will start this round of questioning with Tom Poston. Tom? Thank you, Bud. Uh, it's, it, it was a remarkable thing. Uh, I think we should all be proud of Mr. Tweed. Uh, anyway, uh, number one, how did you, did you ever communicate with U.S. forces besides the time you swam out? Uh, once before. How was that, sir? Uh, actually, I uh, didn't communicate directly, but a native helped me out in this communication. Oh, well, that was still good anyway. Number two, uh, were you ever seen by the Japanese troops? No. Number three, were you ever, by any chance, seen by them? At one time, they came within uh, 30 feet of me, and that's the closest they ever got to me. Oh, they didn't actually see you. They no. just, you, you knew they were there, but they didn't know you were there. Uh, Tell me, number three, how much back pay was involved? I don't want to bring in money here. But I don't, how much back pay was involved when you finally got your pay? Number the, three? Yes. Yeah, that's please. me. Uh, about $6,427 to be. Wow. Peggy. Welcome, sight. Hardly enough to pay you for that, of course. Uh, number one, uh, how did you eat? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, I uh, ate mostly native food, of course, uh, foods that were there available on the island. And uh, the natives. Food to me. I see. Uh, number two, uh, when was the reinvasion of Guam? And the Americans made their initial landing on Guam on uh, July 21st, 1944. Uh, uh, number three, what Marine Division was the first to land on Guam? The third Marine Division. Thank you. <clears throat> number one, what were you doing in Guam? Well, I was attached to the In it. Uh, were there any effects uh, from your diet deficiency? Uh, mainly loss of weight, and uh, I picked up oh some deficiencies such as uh, hookworm and so forth, That's regular quite <laughs> jungle diseases. <laughs> Number three, uh, how much weight did you lose? Uh, about thirty-five pounds during the. Course Num of my Number one, what was your rank? I was a uh, machinist mate. First class. Did you get any promotions while you were? Uh, after, yeah, after. Kitty. Number three, are you any relation of Harrison Tweed? No, but uh, <clears throat> I've stayed at his home once. Uh, number two, what did you wear during that time? 
At the beginning it, or the end? No, well, it says here... <laughs> <laughs> at the end! <laughs> it says in the affidavit that you were there quite a long time, two and a half years. You surely couldn't have worn the same clothes. Uh... I wore mainly the same clothes. Of course, they were patched and repatched, and the patches were patched. Number one, can you tell me if the climate was clement? That's well, a I'm... good question, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see you're not going to answer it. Number... Well... Neither is anyone else, because the time is gone. So get to your clement ballots there, if you will, please, and mark them right now, without change, at once. And, of course, without consultation, as you vote for number one, number two, or number three. Our team of challengers will, as is customary, receive $250 for every incorrect vote. All set, panel? All ballots marked? Tom, for whom did you vote? I think that we could have easily voted for anyone. They're all very smart and, uh, and good. Two of them are good liars. <laughs> I voted for number two. He had the look of a man who would be determined enough to... Uh, hit himself against 28,000 troops of the enemy, and I think it's number two. Peggy. Well, I voted for number three because he looks so strong, I figured he could last two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> Gene, what about your vote? Well, I voted for number two, bud, uh, for several reasons. Uh, he looks like he might be a man who has that rare skill to be a good machinist. And uh, he looks as if he might be about the proper age. And also, his answer on the diet seemed fairly convincing to me. Kitty? Uh, I voted for number three. I think he answered Tom's question terribly well about uh, how much pay was uh, coming to him. Uh, a man in that position would surely know to the exact penny. And I hate to say this, but he looks intelligent enough to have survived two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> I think it required more brains than stamina. All right, there we have it. You can explain what you mean to the other two later. Uh, <laughs> the lines are made up, and the votes are in. Let's find out right now which one of these gentlemen is the World War II hero. So, will the real George Tweed please stand up? <laughs> Well, may I underscore what uh, Tom said, sir, and tell you that we are all genuinely and thoroughly proud to be in your presence tonight, and we thank you for the debt that we owe you. Thank you, bud. I think you'd be uh, interested to know that George Tweed's experience is the subject of a motion picture, No Man is an Island. I wondered if that... I heard That's it in the adversity. Yeah. That's it. All right, number one, would you... Not a word about Zot? <laughs> <laughs> no Man is a Zot. <laughs> uh, number one, your real name, and what do you really do, sir? Uh, my name is J.W. Cosby, and I'm with the National Carbon Company. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Let me thank you. Number three, you've got a half of the vote, so we have your name, and what do you really do? My name is Joe Hansen, and I work at a restaurant called The Sign of the Dove. I'm a bartender. <laughs> bartender. <laughs> Gentlemen, we thank you very much for being with us. You gave us a lot of fun. You played the game extremely well. And let me tell you that the score is two incorrect votes at $250 each. That, of course, means $500 to divide between you from Anison. And on your way out, you'll receive a gift package of the fine products made by Anison. Thank you so much for being with us. Good night, and God bless you. All right, let's meet our next team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Ramona Edith Soto. My name is Ramona Edith Soto. My name is Ramona Edith Soto. Now, panel, before I read this next affidavit to you, I want to call your attention to these authentic American Indian costumes. Two of them are over 100 years old, and all of them are very valuable. Now, will you take out your next card and follow along while I listen, while I read this affidavit? I, Ramona Edith Soto, am an American Indian. My tribal name is Ol Som Bunwas. I am a college student. In September, I entered a contest with girls from 23 other Indian tribes. We were rated on dress, poise, personality, beauty, talent, and our knowledge of Indian lore. 
I was selected by the judges as the current Miss Indian America. Signed, Ramona Edith Soto. <laughs> I think you'll agree, panel, you're looking at three lovely young ladies, each one of whom claims to be Ramona Edith Soto, Miss Indian America. Let us start this round of cross-examination with our visiting host of Play Your Hunch, Gene Rayburn. Thank you, bud. All right. They're all very lovely, aren't they? Uh, number sure three. How? <laughs> <laughs> number three. No fair trying to talk Indian to them. I'm asking the questions now. Let's have... uh, number three. Does uh, the various parts of your costume have any special significance? Yes. For instance, what does uh, the design in the front part of your headband mean? The headband means long life and love and charity. I see. It's quite a lot. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, number one, are there as many Indians in America today as there were a hundred years ago? In America today, I believe there are more Indians. There are more. Number two, what does all Sumbon was mean? What? Kitty. <laughs> ah, thank you, bud. Uh, number three, what, what are the Nape Purse tribe? Where do they live? I, they live in Arizona. Uh, number two, can you name four of the judges in the Miss America contest this year? You Miss were, America? I mean, yes. What, isn't it? It's Miss Indian, Miss Indian America. America. Ah, I'm terribly sorry. Um, do you know where the Nape Purse live? In, um, in New Mexico, yes. In New Mexico. Uh, number two, what does your name mean in uh, English? Olsom Bunwas. Olsom Bunwas means prairie flower. Oh, how pretty. Yeah. <laughs> number three, uh, where was this uh, contest taking place? In Sheridan, Wyoming. Sheridan, Wyoming? Yes. Yeah. Tom Poston. Well, you know, there's, uh, there's a little uh, story in my family that I'm part Indian. I think it all came about when I was following a tar wagon, and I think I became a Blackfoot, but... <laughs> the, but I will ask, uh, number one, if she knows where the Cherokee Indians lived. In Oklahoma. Thank you. Number two, did they, did they, were they always Oklahoma Indians? No, they were originally from South Carolina. Thank you. Number three, might you know where the Shoshone tribe made its home? No, I don't. Oh, do you they know what the Shoshone immigrated. Indians are? They have immigrated from place to place. I remember the Shoshones. There was a book that I read over and over when I was a kid called White Boy with the Indians. I identified with that boy so strongly, and he was living with the Shoshone tribe. That's why I asked that question. Peggy. Uh, number two, could you please tell me uh, the name of the Indian chief who defeated General Custer at the Battle of the Little Big Horn? Yes, it was Sitting Bull, Red Cloud, Lazy Horse, and Dull Knife. Thank you. Number one, could you please, please tell me three tribes of Plains Indians? The Sioux, Blackfoot, and the Crow. Thank you. Uh, number three, do you know who Joseph Brandt was? No, I don't. Number one, do you know who Joseph Brandt no. was? Number two? No. Uh, hmm. Uh, which, number two, which tribe are you from? I'm from the Kiowa. I guess that's all the time we have, panel. It's time for you now to mark your ballots once again. Second time tonight. Get your pencils in hand and your ballots under them and mark now at once and without change. And vote as you do without consultation for number one, number two, or number three. All set, everybody? Tom, or rather Chief Poston, uh, <laughs> which one did you select? Well, I voted for... For number one, I actually based my vote on the answers to the Nepersé question. As you know, Nepersé were named for us by the French, and the French had no access to New Mexico or Arizona at the time the Nepersé were getting their names. Now, whether that's still erroneous or not, I don't know. I voted for number one. Peggy. Yeah. Well, the three of them are all beautiful, but I voted for number one as well because she knew those three Plains Indians. I just learned them last week. <laughs> Gene, which one do you think is the real one? I, uh, listening to the reasons that Tom gave and uh, Peggy gave, I've decided to quit. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two's answer sounded very convincing yeah, to me. Too, and yeah. she answered uh, very uh, briskly and quickly, so I voted for her. 
And Kitty? I voted for number one because I didn't ask her about the nape purse, but I, I think that it's true that they were Canadian. And I think number three's accent is foreign somehow. I don't think it's an Indian accent. And I think number one has great Indian beauty, but I've been quite wrong up to now tonight, so... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have our own little smoke signal get together here and find out which one of these young ladies right now is the real Miss Indian America. So will the real Ramona Edith Soto please... Stand up. Oh. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Number two, may we have your real name and what you really do, please? My real name is Luana Todd, and I'm a cocktail waitress at the Luau 400. <laughs> And number three, your real name and what do you do, please? My name is Leinani Beck, and I'm a hula dancer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, check the score, and we'll find that there was only one incorrect vote. I'm sorry to say, ladies, because uh, ladies understand the value of uh, how much money they win. I think even more than men do, and I'm sorry it wasn't more than that. But it's $250 from Addison, and you gave us great pleasure, and I hope we uh, brightened up your evening, too, by having you here. And on your way out, of course, you'll receive a gift package of all the fine products. And the makers of Anderson, thank you so much for being with us. Good night, and God bless you. Now may I present our third team of challengers. What is your name, please? My name is Tracy Barnes. My name is Tracy Barnes. My name is Tracy Bonds. Would you kindly follow along, panel, with your copies of this affidavit? I, Tracy Barnes, am a hot air balloonist. I fly my balloon all around the country at fairs, celebrations, and supermarket openings. To ascend, I merely turn up a heater, and the hot air forces the balloon to rise into the air. To descend, I turn the heater down. Last year, in competition with the hottest hot air balloonists in the country, I won a test of accuracy to become the national hot air balloon champion. Signed, Tracy Barnes. Very well, panel, you heard these three gentlemen all claiming to be the uh, champion hot air balloonist, Tracy Barnes. Let's see what truth we arrive at, starting with Peggy Katz. Peggy? Um, Mr. Balloonist number two, uh, what's a cold air balloonist? <laughs> there isn't a cold air balloonist. Oh. Well, number three, why are you called a hot air balloonist? Uh, it's called a hot air balloon because we actually uh, heat the air as we ascend. I see. I have a... Thank you. Uh, number one, could you please tell me what kind of a heater do you use? Uh, a similar heater to a Bunsen burner, except larger. That... You mean with flames? Yeah, with flames that heats the air that we already have in the balloon. And... You're a hot air brave balloonist. <laughs> uh, and number uh, two, do you carry sandbags in your balloon? No, no sandbags. It's... Uh... It's a different principle of a balloon. Uh, number three, do you have two heaters in case one goes on the blink? Yes, actually, we do. Yes, yes. it would seem wise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gene, don't tell him how to run his balloon now. <laughs> number three, did your balloon ever spring a leak? Yes, I've actually been flying, and uh, part of the uh, nylon canvas is torn, but uh, I also carry a parachute. Now, how did you fix it that one time it did? You don't, one doesn't have to fix it, actually. You, it uh, will uh, descend very slowly. Oh, I see. You just turn up the Bunsen burner and... Whee! Oh, yes. <laughs> Number two, uh, when you go to a supermarket, uh, how do you get there? Uh, if, <laughs> I mean, if you're in a crowded community and you want to find a supermarket, can you control it enough so you can land right in the roof of the supermarket? Or no, what? it's uh, pretty hard to pick a spot where we land. We, what we do is we take off from the supermarket. Oh. In other words, we do promotional work with it. Kitty. Well, a little birdie told me tonight that it's Tom's birthday. Would you like a balloon for your birthday? A <laughs> balloon for my birthday? <laughs> Would you be That's willing to true. give one Happy of your birthday, balloons Don. to Tom for his birthday? I'll get back out to Mineola with it. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, can you tell me who was the famous um, uh, French balloonist who made the first ascent over Paris? That would probably be Macaulay. Pierre. Uh, Number one, what is your balloon made of? Uh, nylon. The, the balloon part yes. is made of nylon. And number three, what is the accuracy test that you performed? The accuracy test was actually performed during a uh, winter carnival 
And where did you land? And uh, the course was from one frozen lake to another, and the accuracy uh, was to land on a specific spot. Number one, how big is your balloon? The balloon is about 60 feet tall, 46 feet in diameter. Birthday boy? Yes. Tom? Happy thank birthday. You. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm very young still, friend. <laughs> I wondered uh, how the uh, increase in the heat of the air increased the lift potential. I'll ask number one to begin with. Would you tell us, please, uh, how that, uh, what ratio that is? In other words, for instance, you always have the same confined space to put your hot air in, correct, number one? Well, the air is already in the balloon. Right. Yeah. Now, as you heat it, does the increase in degree temperature increase your lift? Yes, the air in the balloon uh, gets warmer, so therefore it rises. Number three? Would you say that the air the stays constant have, in the I balloon there? Say that all the time. We have, and the filibuster rule That's is not in effect. Question. So, will you kindly mark your ballots? Mark them now and without change. At once, please. Of course, without consultation. That goes without saying. Voting as you do for number one, number two, or number three. All ballots marked very well. Tom, which one do you think is the real one? Well, this time? listen, I, I voted for what must seem an obvious reason. It might seem an obvious reason to you, too. I had the feeling that while everyone seemed to know what he was talking about, number two, mended. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he's the guy that's been going up and down in this thing. And he talks like he really has to go out from here and get back in that thing and go up and down again. So I voted for number two. Peggy. Well, I voted for number one because two and three knew so much about it and they volunteered lots of information. We didn't ask number one enough, so I think it's number one. Gene, what have I You're right, we didn't ask number one. Now that I look at him, he's got that kind of ruddy complexion as if he... So no, I voted for heat. number two. That's how smart I am. <laughs> he's pale and sickly looking. <laughs> and... <laughs> Kitty. Well, I seem to be basing my votes tonight on looks as well. I think number three looks kooky enough to do this. <laughs> How to win friends and something else. I don't quite know the end of it in your case. But in any event, there we have it with our rhymes and reasons, specious though they may be. Let's see what sort of truth we arrive at as we learn which one of these gentlemen is the real hot air balloonist. So will the real... Tracy Barnes, please fly up. <laughs> oh, gentlemen, you have my permission to go at this panel any way you want after this show and the things they've said about you. Let's find out about your two sidekicks here. Number one, what is your real name and what do you really do, sir? My name is Bill Deland. I'm a teacher of speech and English at Hollywood High School in California. <laughs> and number three, your real name, sir, and what do you do? My name is Don Spark. I own and operate a restaurant here in New York called Spark's Pub. better than the girls, at least, because you have two incorrect at $250 each. That, of course, is a total of $500 for you to divide amongst you, and we thank you for bringing us such good fun. This money, of course, comes from Anison, and from them also a gift package of the fine products made by them, and we thank you very much for being with us. Goodbye, and God bless you. All the time we have for tonight, except may I remind you once again this year that when you give the United Way, your gift works many, many wonders. Through services for children, families, the sick, the elderly, give your fair share too. Give United, if you will. Good night, panel, you wonderful people. Good, good night, night, buddy. Yay, hey, man. Happy <laughs> birthday again to you, Doc. Oh, yes. <laughs> and good night to all of you, and don't forget to join us the same time next week, and I'll be with you again tomorrow afternoon on the daytime version of the show. And may I remind you once again, saying good night for Anderson, to tell the truth. Good night, everybody. <laughs> to tell the truth is a Mark Goodson, Bill Todman production. Tell the truth as
been brought to you by Tristan Nasal Mist, the new decongestion spray for relief from miseries of sinus congestion and head colds. This is Johnny Olson saying goodnight from To Tell the Truth. This program is pre-recorded.